Welcome to today's webinar compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. All of our webinars are interactive. We encourage you to pose questions to our guests. The more challenging, the better. And the earlier you get the questions in, the better the chance of having them answered. The recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. Indeed it will be and it's, uh, well, here we are again, Stuart and I, in uh, our monthly update of the BizNews portfolio and we've got some quite interesting changes to be made. I've been dying to add Tongat to the uh, portfolio but unfortunately haven't been able to yet uh, and I will hopefully um, be able to explain why it's going to be added now. But Stu, just take us through the uh, stories about the tech and make sure everybody can hear us. Excellent. Thanks, Alex. Always good to be here. Our monthly catch up and hope everyone's listening loud and clear. As if you can see my face, Alec will join us now on the cameras and there's a nice presentation that's about to kick off behind me. Um, if you can hear my voice loud and clear, please let us know. There is a little high five button on the control panel on your right hand side. I can see some high fives coming through. Please just let us know if it is loud enough. There is a little communication tool there which where you can put your questions in. And um, we do like to keep it conversational. I know Alex got some exciting news for us, so we will let him speak for a while, but we do want the questions, please. They are on the control panel on the right hand side. If you put them in there, I'll pass them on to Alec um, as we go through. But I see lots to look forward to, Alec. Yeah, before we go any further, can you hear? Okay. I'm just uh, making sure we got all the tech right. <laughs> it's going to be so cool. Next month, yes. we'll be in our new studio and we'll have proper cameras and uh, all kinds of interesting, fascinating technology to share with you. We are moving out of this studio on the 7th of May. Uh, we've been We've been doing our Business Power Hour. If you haven't yet discovered it, just go into businessradio.com and have a listen. Uh, there's easy music, kind of easy music anyway. We, we, we're still trying That's to, around, yeah. yeah, we're going to try and find the right soundtrack, but we've just paid for our license uh, for, for music. So we're allowed to now stream easy music to you through the day. And then between Hoppers 4, uh, sorry, Hoppers 5 and Hoppers 6 every evening, we have the Business Power Hour. And if you go onto businessradio.com, you'll be able to listen to the music and you'll be able to uh, also tune into the Power Hour. We will in future also be streaming. I know we won't be, hey, because this is only for premium, premium subscribers. Yeah. No, we can't. We stream the other webinars, Alec, but not the premium one. Other webinars get streamed, <laughs> not this one. Okay, good stuff, Stu. All right, well, you've seen that we are not cardboard cutouts. So Stuart and I will take our uh, pretty faces off the screen now, and we'll go straight into our presentation. And as you can see, we're up a little bit in the past month. Compound annual growth rate has gone from 22% to 23.1%. That is in US dollars. That goes back seven years. So it's, uh, it's well, six, six and a quarter years, actually, to be precise. So that's a pretty good return uh, and 28% in rands. What has been interesting about all of this, going through the numbers again, is how well, relatively speaking, the rand has done in the last six and a quarter years. But uh, let's get into today's webinar on the basis of, I uh, need to just get something fiddled around here with the technology, my apologies. So uh, the RAND has been pretty strong though recently, Alec, okay? it's bouncing around 14.20. So well, well, we don't, uh, we, aren't, we aren't used to that. We aren't yeah. used to the RAND uh, doing what it's been. And you can see there, in, the, in RAND terms in the past month, the portfolio has gone up 3%, but in dollar terms, it's 6.6%. So actually, the RAND has clawed back 3% in one month against the US dollar. That's These are extraordinary numbers. So exactly as Stu was saying, it has bounced around quite a lot, but it has certainly been on an upward trend, but so is our portfolio. When you have a look at that, double-figure increases for six of the nine stocks. Uh, Amazon to go from $3,075 to $3,400. Apple also good, Microsoft 
very strong as well, a new high there for Microsoft. Wilson Bailey, a value proposition, a bet on the infrastructure boom in South Africa. To you, one of my favorite stocks, uh, I get quite a lot of uh, ribbing on that one from a, a neighbor of mine uh, who calls himself the most devoted premium subscriber except, excepting for to you. Uh, and zero has really come back well. That price for zero, by the way, is in US dollars, not in Aussie dollars. In Aussie dollars, it's trading at just under 140 Aussie dollars. You could have got it for about 100 Aussie dollars, depending on the timing of your purchase. But really good rebound in the past month for zero as well. And you will recall that we bought zero over a three month period. So I'm sure there are gonna be lots of questions about that uh, as we go forward. But let's just have a look at the portfolio before today's changes. You'll remember last month, we went through quite an involved uh, process of looking at bubble territory for some of the uh, stocks that were in the portfolio, which would be classified as emerging tech. And we took a decision to sell out of Spotify, um, Cloudflare, and uh, what was the third one? Can't remember offhand, but we'll get to it in a moment. Anyway, there were three stocks that we sold out of, and the reason for that was that they're very much emerging. Uh, oh, sorry, the third one was Adobe, which was quite a, uh, you know, I really, really thought about it hard and eventually worked on the basis that it was extremely highly valued. Um, maybe it was, uh, I, I got a few emails from people saying to me, hey, you, made, you made a mistake on Adobe and I, I hope they held on to it because uh, Adobe has got much stronger since the uh, decision to sell it out of our portfolio, but you can't win them all. And uh, we're quite happy with the positioning of the portfolio now, when you're going into this month, you'll see there's 12%. It's very difficult to read the little box at the bottom. So what I've done is I've actually pulled that out and put it on, put the highlights, if you like, on the top. And it'll show you there how well these particular stocks have done and uh, our best performed by far. Amazon, very good performances from Apple and Microsoft. And uh, Discovery and Netflix are next in line. NASPERS. I really debated a lot about NOSPAS in this past month. I'm very worried about what's going on in China with Tencent. The government there has come, has issued edicts really after Jack Ma uh, made, you know, he, he's been he's been baiting the government, uh, the Chinese uh, Communist Party, for probably five or six years, and eventually they they turned back and turned pretty nasty uh, to Jack Ma by cancelling with one way to go, one day to go, the biggest IPO in history, the Alipay IPO, which was part of uh, Alibaba, which is Jack Ma's company. In fact, Alipay, although he has resigned and retired from Alibaba, he's the chairman of Alipay. So this was his big play. And the government cancelled that listing effectively and has come out subsequent to that and has now forced antitrust type legislation onto Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, the three biggies in the Chinese internet market. And it is forcing them to allow competitors to advertise on their platform or to actually be in their platform. And that is going to affect Tencent's profits in a big way. So I was I was really scheming about it a lot and thinking, well, should we be selling our NASPARS? Uh, it has come down a lot in the past month, as you saw from the, the previous slide. Uh, it's dropped by 5%, which is a big decline in a rising market where everything else seems to be going up. Uh, and eventually I decided that it was premature to sell it. And the reason for that is that Naspers has sold a, um, another two percentage points of its 10 cent holding. It's got another $10 billion. It's probably going to be putting five billion of that into buying back its own shares. So you can anticipate that NASPERS will be supporting its share price for a period of time. And at the current level, if NASPERS were to do the unthinkable, and it is unthinkable for two reasons: one, they have said they're not going to sell any more 10 cent shares, and two, they missed the deadline, as we heard from Pete Maton and the Business Power Hour last week for doing unbundling. Had they unbundled the 10 cent holding, which is 
would really be sensible uh, to do, had they done that, then NASPAS would not be landed with a massive tax bill, which is now coming through. They would have had a tax bill, but not the to the degree that has now been implemented because of changes to the tax regulations. So they've missed that boat. They've also, in their latest sale of 10 cents, said they will not be selling for another three years. But if something happens and they do decide to unbundle the 10 cent shareholding, NASPAS's share price would likely go up by 30 to 40%. So you didn't really want to be in a position where you're exposing yourself at this point in time when they're buying back their shares and there is always that potential for unbundling, even though they've said they don't want to do it. I thought that as a consequence of that, let's wait and watch the NASPAS share price and see when normality returns or when people say, oh, well, you know, maybe the Chinese government is not really going to hurt uh, Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu and the others as much as, as as some anticipate, I think it is going to hurt them big time because when you have a, a monopoly and then antitrust legislation comes in and that monopoly fades away, it knocks your profits. It's just a reality of life. But uh, to sell NASPERS at this stage when you've got a few of those uncertainties, not really a, a good idea. The 10 cent share price hasn't really reacted that badly to the legislation or the proposed antitrust legislation in China, but maybe that's because people aren't haven't really done their sums yet. Whatever the case might be, we're watching NicePass. It's on the list to be sold. It's 9% of the shares. We don't need the money right now because we've got 12% cash and we didn't need it for the purchases that we're making today. So that sleeping dog is lying. As far as the rest are concerned, uh, Netflix was the other one that went back or pulled back a little bit, as you can see, uh, down 1.6%. That was after financial results came out from Netflix. For, you, for a lengthy period, you might recall, I had a very different view to most commentators about Apple. Uh, the focus of Wall Street on Apple was about the sales of iPhones. And if iPhone sales went down, then the Apple share price fell. If iPhone sales were higher than anticipated, then the Apple, Apple share price went up. I felt that this was kind of missing the point because Apple is an ecosystem of services and its real value is in being able to offer that ecosystem to its customers. And once you're in the Apple ecosystem, it's very hard to leave. You don't really want to leave because they've got great products. Anyway, that seems to be, uh, the penny seems to have dropped on that one. But when it comes to Netflix, what they're looking at at the moment, what the traders are looking at or what the marketplace seems to be looking at with Netflix is what is the quarterly growth in the subscriber numbers. And Netflix articulated very well in the uh, investor presentation uh, for the past quarterly that the reason why the subscriber numbers did not reach their anticipated level was because they haven't had the new product that has come onto the uh, onto the platform and they haven't had any hits in the past quarter. And the reason for that is because of COVID, they haven't been able to produce as many um, productions. And that's wh why they are saying that uh, they, they haven't been able to reach the number of new subscribers because they need the hits to pull people in. And you can understand that Bridgerton uh, was a very big hit for the previous quarter. And you can anticipate that in the quarter ahead, they've got a, a, a movie called Red Notice. I'm, I'm not sure what it's about, but I think it could be Bill Browder's story. Uh, and, and that would be a, a, a something that is likely to be quite uh, eagerly anticipated. But that's what Netflix is about. Netflix is uh, fighting with the um, free-to-air televisions services, but it needs that, that little bump. We see it in our business as yeah. well. We see it in Business Premium as well. We think Business Premium is a fantastic product, and, and you do too, because you subscribe to Business Premium. But to actually come in for the first time, you almost need a trigger. So it's finding a story or something that you really want to read, or a webinar like this that you want to go to. Then you sign up for Business Premium. And once you're there, you think, crumbs, why didn't I pay the £4.99 years ago? Because it's such a good service. Netflix is exactly the same. You're literally paying 130 Rand a month for Something that's so it's it's what about a sixth of what you pay for uh, for, DSTV. for DSTV, and yet 
if it wasn't for sport, which they're moving into, Netflix are going into that uh, level, you would you just get such a fantastic uh, um, business. You, you uh, I guess that, and that's what's happening around the world as well. So Netflix's share price came back below five hundred dollars a share. I was quite keen to add a few more Netflixes, but we've got a we've we've done well out of it, as you can see on uh, on that portfolio. We've up ninety two percent in US dollars. Let's not be greedy. We've got seven percent of the portfolio there. I was saying on Netflix, I think they won 12 Oscars or were involved in 12 Oscar awards. And I was going to say, are, are the, isn't the investment community not moving too slowly with the way the world is changing and how they view stocks? You know, like you said, they stick to subscriber numbers. But that's old That's old ways of looking at top line numbers and stuff, where if you look at their cash on balance sheet, the fact that they're not using... They, they've got through the, 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 the tipping the, point. So. Mm. I, I think you're right, and and the Oscars is a very good story because now if you Netflix and you're marketing, yeah. it's it's like you've just been given a, a huge boost because don't you want to see the Oscar movies? I'm sure those who haven't watched My Octopus Teacher yeah. are going to go and watch it. Uh, it's a magnificent movie, the the one done in Cape Town that uh, that won an Oscar this year. It's likely to get a huge boost. I was thinking about it this morning um, when Linda van Tilburg interviewed the guy who made it. Craig, I forget his surname now, but it's... But, but we, he was easy to interview. Yeah. You know, he was available. There was no problem, even though it had been a big hit on Netflix. Now he's no, you can't get, <laughs> get hold of him for uh, because he's just very, very popular. And it's the same thing. So they've won all these Oscars. The Oscars are now going to be promoted. If you want to see the movie, my octopus teacher, you're going to have to subscribe to Netflix. Then you you pay your 135 rand, and you say, "Crumbs, why haven't I done it ages ago?" It's it's that whole process that's kicking into place. So stick with Netflix. We're very happy, uh, even though some people in the uh, in the investment community weren't that excited about it. Stu, uh, just to remind on the questions, uh, have you got any? Got a few. Um, okay. This is on the on the Netflix story. Peter asks, it's gone sideways for a while and competition is growing in the US, Disney Plus, Apple TV, Hulu. But I think we've sort of covered why we stick with it. It's a good question and it, and you can never repeat it enough. The free-to-air uh, television uh, market is the target for Netflix. So Netflix is uh, the streaming, the other streaming services. Certainly when you talk to Netflix founder Reed Hastings, not talk to him, but when you listen to his investor presentations, he repeats this continuously. He said he's not worried about Disney. He's not worried about the other streaming services because nobody actually buys one streaming service. You don't. I, I know in our household, we've got Netflix, we've got DSTV, Showmax, uh, Apple TV, uh, even Amazon Prime. So, uh, and even Gaia, we've got those. So we can go amongst the, Gaia is one you shouldn't really be mentioning in Ballard Company, but you have like some of these crazy theories, which are fun to watch uh, and, and some really good historical stuff too. But those are in our family. And when you look to about a hundred rand a month each, it really isn't a, a, a big investment. I don't, I don't know when I last watched free to air TV actually. Um, I, I think it was when I was in my teens, and I, I really, it's since multi choice has come in, there's been no need to. So, yeah. You, you think about it. It's, it's, so as you move up the income level and you can afford these things, and pretty much everybody is, when you drive to Durban from Johannesburg, look on the right hand side at the informal settlements. Every single house has got a dish. They've got a, a so it's, and some of those packages are like a hundred rand for DSTV or, and once you're there, then you go to Netflix, you get your free uh, um, streaming from wherever you might be sitting in whatever coffee shop or at, at work or whatever they do. So it's a market that's just starting and very, not just in the United States where it still has, I think it's under 15% market share against free to air television, but in the other parts of the world, it's a fraction. So Netflix has got huge runway, as have all the other streaming companies. And it's a little like what we do with podcasts. We believe that podcasts will replace eventually free-to-air radio because they're just so much more convenient. If you want to watch a Netflix movie, you watch it, you don't watch any ads. If you want to listen to one of our podcasts, you put it on, you don't get interrupted by lots of advertising and in fact you can get nice good long form podcasts on, on a subject that you're really interested in because you will acquire that rather than having to listen through lots of other gunk before you get to the part that you're interested in. 
So all around, uh, it's a trend, it's a mega trend uh, from consumption of media um, on uh, by appointment. In other words, go and listen to the seven o'clock or come to our business power hour at 5.30. Uh, or else consumption on demand. Well, you can listen to our business power hour at the time that suits you by downloading it from our podcast uh, platform. So that's there's a lot of runway. It's a big story and it's the one that we're sticking with there. Just on Netflix, Alec, um, Schwab wants to know, obviously regarding the competitors, what's your thoughts on multi-choice? I think they've got such a stranglehold on sport in South Africa. And we're such a sport crazy country because of our incredible weather and, and our good sports people. Uh, they, they're they going out there, they, whether it's Casta Semenya or uh, um, the, 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 these young golfers, Higo is the latest one who's now breaking through. We like to watch our countrymen taking on the rest of the world. And that is a great advantage that multi-choice have got. So if you own the shares and it's not, they're not expensive, uh, there's, uh, again, they are competing with free-to-air television. Because eventually, as you upgrade from ETV and um, SABC, where do you go to? How do you upgrade? You pay a little bit more and you get, what, you get to watch what you want to watch. So uh, they've got massive, massive, massive runway. Remember, it's, a, it's an African country, an African company too. And they've done deals with Amazon and Netflix. I was going to say, they're embracing the competition. They're not sort of tacking head on. Well, when they, when they spun off multi-choice, uh, you could see a new energy that, that uh, existed. In, I've been in that building a few times. Uh, and m a complete change in the whole philosophy to, as you would expect, now their bonuses and every and their, their, their whole future, their whole wealth is tied up in how multi-choice works. So whereas in the past, it was easy to sit back and just enjoy the benefits of Tencent <laughs> because they were part of an house Alex, just Sean wants to know, for a non-financial person, how can one learn more on company fundamentals before investing? In other words, how do you research the companies you invest in? I, I really suggest, uh, Sean, download from Amazon, my book, How to Invest Like Warren Buffett, it's written for new investors. It's an easy read, and it's actually a little bit like an appetizer to open up this whole new world of investing. You know, I was very involved at one point in the horse racing industry, and it is a, a lifelong search for more knowledge by going through pedigrees, by understanding horses, understanding how their conformation works, understanding what works with pedigrees and what doesn't. It's massive, massive research, and you never, ever get to the, the solution. And equities are exactly the same. Buying in shares is the same. But you've got to start somewhere, so go and read the book. And in the book, there's about three or four pages at the back, which has got further reading material. What I, I would also urge you to do is read the annual reports of these companies, because and, and I did for, for 15 years. I wrote an annual report when um, I'd listed my, my company, MoneyWeb, on the JSC. And I really took my time to write to shareholders. We had about a 1,000 shareholders to write to them, to say to them, this is what we've done in the past year. This is why we've done it. This is where we, we made mistakes. And you'll find that Buffett tells you to trumpet your, your uh, missteps. And this is where we've been more successful. So if you get that kind of a from the, the, the manager, the CEO of the company telling you in the annual report, he realizes that you're a co-owner of that company. And as a, if it makes sense to you as a co-owner of the company, then it's nice to have a little slice of it. If it doesn't make sense to you, if the strategy means nothing to you, uh, then I would suggest that you find something else to invest in. But do your homework first. And the way you do your homework, start with, with the... Uh, how to invest like Warren Buffett book. It it won't uh, it, it really won't stress you. It's very easy reading, and then that will push you into a new direction, and you you'll be starting to do uh, you know, having a lot of fun on something. Just on the Buffett book, Alec. Um, Stephen wants to know where you can download it. Is Amazon uh, Amazon.com. Amazon. Yeah, it's there. I think it's ten dollars or something. So okay. it's uh, we don't we get a very small percentage <laughs> of that, but it's there. It's it's on Amazon. It's accessible. 
Um, it's also on, it'll be on our Biz News shop, which we, we you should tell us when we're going to launch that. Yeah, um, hopefully in the next week, Alec. We're in the next week, yeah. okay. Um, we just, just Excuse me, Yeah. yeah. Just, you know, tech tech always looks easy from the outside, yeah? <laughs> but we'll get there in a week. Stu's been at it. He's been he's been uh, working with Tim, who's our, our tech consultant, and we're just about ready to well relaunch it. We used to have a shop, but it never really worked. So we're going to be putting lots of interesting things into the business, and we even got the URL, haven't we? It's called businessshop.com. Yeah, business okay, so that'll be it'll also be there and. Uh, I am looking to do an update on it as soon as time permits. Maybe we should go into our purchases, our adjustments. Now you'll know uh, if you've been attending this webinar for a while that I've really wanted to buy or add Tonga Hewlett to the web to the portfolio. There have been a few reasons for this. I really like the new management. Uh, they are uh, they, they're very impressive. Gavin Hudson, uh, Rob Aitken. Uh, it, you just get a feeling that these guys are in there to make a big difference. It's also a hundred year plus kind of company. It's been around forever. It's got so much uh, asset value that hasn't really been unlocked. And it's gone through a bad time. And that's a, a very good motivator. When you've got a, 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 a venerable business, if you like, which has really hit rough times, you get good management in there and they start sweating assets that haven't even, have never had a drop of sweat from them for years gone by. It's a long story, the whole Tongard story, but it isn't a Steinhoff. There were over optimistic forecasts, but there was, it doesn't seem to have been much crookery. Well, we don't know. There's still the criminal charges that are being pressed against the old managers, but it certainly wasn't a way that the managers enriched themselves in the way that, or put in that kind of a fraudulent uh, approach that Eusta did. But if you look at this market cap, and I love putting this kind of a graph up, because it shows you the value, the way the market valued this company was at over 20 billion rands for quite a, an extended period, certainly over 15 billion rand for most of the last. 10 years, it's currently sitting at 1.4 billion rand. So if it just gets its act together, if it only goes to half of what it used to be worth, you're talking about a five-fold increase. And we, we know all this. My problem with it was I didn't understand how it was going to become an exponential company. I looked at Tonga Hewlett from every possible angle. We had a an hour-long webinar with uh, Gavin Hudson, the CEO, who came from SAB Miller, so great pedigree. And I just couldn't find why it would become exponential. And then, just over two weeks ago, we had an interview on our power uh, with a man called Eddie Cross. Eddie Cross is a Zimbabwean. He was uh, on the MDC, in other words, on the opposition. He was an outspoken critic of what was going on in Zimbabwe. And he started telling us what's happening there now. And it's almost like the Zimbabwe story has been a, a series of um, optimistic forecasts followed by disasters. And that has put a lot of people, turned a lot of people off Zimbabwe. But there are very sound reasons now for believing that Zimbabwe is finally starting to get its act together. And Tonga Hewlett has got a huge exposure to Zimbabwe. It owns Hippo and Triangle, two enormous uh, sugar operations, which, as you can imagine, have been written down to virtually nothing. They've also been really hurting the financial results. In the uh, first half of the year to September last year, they had to write back a lot of money because of hyperinflation. What Eddie Cross said to us, now remember, this is the critic who's now still living in Zimbabwe. He's 81 years old. He's been around the block more times than most of us have, have, have run around the block. He was saying that things have really, really turned. And in particular, the hyperinflation, which was at 800% a month just a, a, a little while ago, is now down to 2% a month. So things are... He, he maintains that uh, that inflation is 
back in a in a manageable area. I mean, nobody wants to really see inflation of 20%, but that's a heck of a long way from the hundreds of percent. Sorry, I think it was 800% a year. It couldn't have been, couldn't have been a month. Anyway, it was hyperinflation. And once you get inflation under control, Tonga Hewlett is going to be able to account for its assets in Zimbabwe very differently. Instead of being a negative, it can be a positive. It's also exporting about 40% Sorry, the export, it's exporting about 30% of what it produces in Zimbabwe, but that's growing at 40% a year. So there's a big opportunity there. And this uh, table taken from the uh, September uh, interim results kind of tells it all. Here's a business that's worth 1.3 billion Rand. It's got 6 billion Rand in debt. They've taken their debt down from 11 billion to 6. They sold off uh, a big division. Have a look there in the very middle column at the bottom indicative fair value of developable land a part of this whole business put the sugar one side because sugar is the biggest part of it and and uh, despite what you think about the health impact of sugar there are many developing countries and sugar demand is growing because people in developing countries as they get wealthier they want to have more of the sugar containing products. That's just the reality. It's a bit like the cigarette uh, manufacturers. But if you have a look down the middle, the middle there at 11 billion rands, indicative fair value of developable land. So just take everything else out of the picture, just the land on the KwaZulu Natal uh, coast. According to Tonga Hewlett, new managers who are highly conservative, they say it's worth about 11 billion rand. They've got debt in this company of six. So the land alone gives you a net positive of 5 billion rand. The market value of the company is 1.4 billion rand. So just to get to the value, the fair value of the land that's sitting on the balance sheet, the developable land, and these are the, these are the guys, by the way, who developed the whole of Mklanga, you are talking about a multiple of the current share price. But where the exponentiality comes in is the Zimbabwe turnaround factor. So you. And to me, you can't really lose money on this one. Um, you could have if they weren't able to sell off their starch division. And after they did the deal in the starch division, the purchasers, Barlow Rand, tried to get out of it. Uh, they, in fact, had to go to arbitration and force Barlow Rand to purchase or to, to, to fulfill their obligation on that. They were claiming that COVID-19 had changed uh, the, the whole uh, basis of it and Tongard said that it hadn't, and Tongard actually won. But that is a very, very big part to the story, and it hasn't been appreciated in the share price. Also, you've got the Zimbabwe turnaround factor. So you're getting, a, you're getting an option here on Zimbabwe. If Eddie Cross is right, and I have no reason to believe that with all his experience, he'd start bullbucking us, uh, we've got a wonderful turnaround situation here and an exponential opportunity. So it makes the exponential portfolio. Alec, I'm quite excited because after that webinar with Gavin, I personally bought Tonga because I think he's a he's got something, and I know what you invest in human potential as well as the um, assets themselves. But I think he can take the company quite far. So you must have bought it cheap then. No, I got it. <laughs> it was a good, it was a good tip that webinar, really. Yeah, yeah we've, we've, had, we had a, we've had a few webinars that have been good tips. Sassel, getting very Yeah. <laughs> anyway, go yeah. Um, but it's, I think Cecil was what, 70 or 80 yeah. Rand and, and David Shapiro said, no, he's only going to buy it under 70. <laughs> and it went under 70 and he didn't buy. And of yeah. course now it's two, 230 or whatever it is. But that's the Tongot story. So I'm very happy that we've now finally added that to the portfolio. Um, what we've done, because the share price is 10 Rand 40, we've bought the allocation, which was 4% of the portfolio has now been invested in Tongot Hewlett. That's been a, a full investment. Just on Tongot, Alec, there's just two questions on the sugar element. So Doe wants to know, in t how much of a factor of new sugar consumption regulations do you think we'll have? And then Peter says, isn't Hewlett a price taker with sugar that adds risk? It does add risk. And uh, sugar is not, um, you're not producing a product that uh, is, uh, it's, it's a little bit like cigarettes in a way. But there are many developing countries uh, where sugar consumption is rising, and we we mustn't be distracted by that. The 
it's easy to get distracted by reading the media we read, which is very focused on the Western world. But as people uh, in, in developing countries get richer, they want sugar containing products. And no one's going to stop them from, from taking that. So yes, there are there's sugar taxes. And, uh, and here in South Africa, we're trying to be uh, holier than, than, uh, than the, the holiest. Uh, or more woke than the wokest. Uh, but the, the reality is that human beings will eat bar ones and drink soft drinks uh, long, long, long after I've departed this, this earth. And Tongard Hewlett is producing a product that people love. So, I'll say yeah. Buffett's the best uh, marketing agent for Tongard, Alex. Coca Cola. <laughs> yeah. He, drink, he, he says, and I love Buffett's approach to this, he says, I will consume the calories. In the, um, the number of calories I need to consume if, or, or I, I know is healthy for me every day in the proportion and through the products that I like. And I like Coca-Cola. So don't tell me to stop drinking Coca-Cola. I will drink less or I'll eat less cake or whatever it might be. So hopefully at some point in time that will come become part of the, of the discourse. But yes, the politicians are on a, a sugar racket at the moment. They don't like it. Um, but uh, that, that's that's in the price, and then some more. Wouldn't the tax also? Because I know you say that in it, it's more for the tax on the politician side. Does that impact from an investment point of view? You know, they keep well, on trying to lift the sugar tax. Well, what the tax would do is it would encourage those products that are using sugar to use less sugar. It's it's really a way of re reducing the consumption of sugar in the general population. But uh, for most people, are you gonna are you gonna bother if a if a Coca Cola costs you ten rand or nine rand fifty five, and not at the moment? So the tax is nowhere near a level where it's going to affect consumption just yet. Uh, it in the future it could, but then again, not in developing countries. Developing countries are not going in that route uh, along that path at the moment. Okay, and here's the second one. I, I have highlighted this in a previous. Um, discussion that it certainly was in one of the uh, premium newsletters. Purple Group, it's been around a long time. And for most of this time, up until five years ago, Purple Group was a, a, a high risk venture. Um, Mark Barnes, a, a former investment banker, would find uh, various opportunities that he would he would invest in. Some of them looked really good. Some of them, as you can see there, 2012, not so good. Uh, the, the core of the business was a company run by Charles Savage, a global trader, it was called. It was a, a trading business. And so when you had trading, uh, accelerated trading in international markets, then the Purple Group would make a lot of money. And when, it, when the traders then all went bust, uh, then the Purple Group wouldn't make much money. Charles Savage has said, so I'm, I'm not uh, releasing any confidences here, but he said they went out of the trading side. They realized that the future is about having customers who actually make money, not customers who lose money. And trading is a zero sum game. Don't take my word for it. Listen to Charles Savage if you want. He's just, he's worked in this industry for decades and he knows, I think he knows what he's talking about. But they then changed the business model and launched Easy Equities five years ago. Easy Equities is not for everybody. It's not for the investor who is more sophisticated, who wants to put a limit on the price that they pay for a particular asset, who, who want to have stop losses. It's for the, the newer investor who wants a savings plan. Uh, so they'll be putting in a certain amount every month they don't really mind if they're paying one rand twenty or one rand twenty-five or one rand thirty-five for the stock. They are buying into a story and they're doing rand cost averaging over a lengthy period of time. So it's not a competitor with Standard Bank Web Trader, I don't think. And in fact, uh, um, Brett Duncan has said this on numerous occasions. He said that there's a different market that they're serving. However, what Purple Group have done and what Easy Equities have done is strike a couple of phenomenal deals. They uh, have had a partnership uh, with Baldwin Properties on 
prop on property. They made 1.7 million rand out of that in the past year, in the sorry, in the past six months, in the six months to uh, the end of February. And what they do there is that they purchase flats and then fractionalize the flats. So if you want to, if you believe that residential property is a good opportunity uh, as a uh, Easy Equities client, and they've now got 800,000 of them, um, you can put in 100 rand and buy a, a slice of a Baldwin property uh, flat. And they moved, I think they've moved about 50 flats already or uh, French, uh, syndicated 50, 50 flats already in the past six months and made a profit out of it. And of course, on, on equities, it's even more exciting because you can buy 50 rands worth of Amazon shares, which as you know, from the Amazon share price, the current is going to cost you $3,400 for one Amazon share. So the time has come in a South African context for Purple Group. And I really believe that this is an exponential company that we need to be investing in now because if people, people are clever, people are very, very smart, uh, the man in the street. And of course, they, they get caught up with emotions and sometimes they're going to lose a lot of money by being really silly. But over the longer term, they will see the advantage of investing in equities, especially if you make it easy for them to do 100 grand here and you don't charge them much. The uh, easy equities costs are fractional, very, very small. So you can buy a fractional and you pay very low costs. It's an easier way to invest than to put your money in a, in a bank account. Again, it's a little bit like that story we spoke about earlier with Netflix. Netflix is competing with free-to-air television. It's got about 10% of the market, uh, between 10 and 15% of the market, depending on how you want to quantify it. Purple Group owns 70% of Easy Equities. Easy Equities is competing with other trading, with other savings vehicles, not with other stockbrokers because there's a, it's a different market, but you'd put your money into a savings account with a bank in the past. Now, instead of that, you'll be putting that money into uh, an exchange traded fund, or if you're more sophisticated into individual shares. The one thing that bothers me about easy equities is the share price has gone crazy. It went up to one Rand 35 after results. I wrote about it uh, when it was a Rand, and I said, we're putting it in our portfolio. Now I've, uh, I missed the, um, the opportunity earlier on. It should have been in our portfolio. I wasn't absolutely certain. And when these financial results came out uh, for the six months to the end of February, I thought this is a good time. And you can see this is exponentiality. Look at that. Revenue up 200% year on year. This is just easy equities and that's what we're buying here. The other parts of the group are very small. Net profit, they've turned around from 2.6 million net profit, which is a heck of a, a tiny profit for a heck of a lot of work, they made 42 million in easy equities for the six months to February. And you go all the way down there and you can see there are very strong reasons why this is that exponential company that has broken through. Part of the reason why it's broken through is because of the deal they did with Capitec. Now, we know Capitec is a, uh, is a success story of its own, and I've been looking at Capitec as well as a possible addition to this portfolio. But to anticipate exponentiality from Capitec, from where it's come from and where it is at the moment, is really, it's a bit of a stretch. If you have it in your own portfolio, uh, don't even think about selling it. But to bring it into our portfolio at this point in time, it's not really giving us much of a margin of safety, although I don't think the share price is going to be uh, an underperformer if you were to take a three to five year view. Capitec is a phenomenal company. But what Capitec has done is it's had a number of partners, the partnerships, for instance, it doesn't offer home loans, so it's got a partnership with SA Home Loans. It's got a partnership with Easy Equities. And if you're a Capitec bank, if you have a Capitec bank account, when you open your app, which is where most Capitec uh, clients uh, do transact right up there on on your app as you open it is easy equities now that is real estate which is impossible to uh, to to count the cost of and easy equities since they did the deal with capitec which really is just a, a deal of slightly better uh, brokerage for capitec clients 
there has been a surge in the number of new accounts that have been opened and it's exactly in that market. It's completely in the sweet spot. So Easy is just starting its exponentiality. And I don't want to talk about what's going on in Australia because that's exciting and they're already breaking even there. Uh, but it is an exponential company, the kind of company that should be in this portfolio. What bothers me is the share prices run very, very hard. And you can see that there. So what we're doing is we're trying to take the share price out of the equation. And unlike with Tonga Hewlett, where there's a, a fat margin of safety, on this one, which incidentally is worth about the same as Tonga Hewlett, which is kind of scary if you, if you think about uh, how much of the future is being discounted. On this one, we are only buying one third of our allocation this month. So we're going to be buying one third, one third, one third, the same way as we do when we buy stocks internationally to take the exchange rate out of it. Here we're taking the price action out of it. And I'm hoping that as there is no more news flow coming out of purple or anticipated, who knows with these guys, it could be anything, but uh, as there's unlikely to be more news flow that is going to push the price around, that we will be able to accumulate the shares over the next three months at uh, prices that are reasonable or better for the long term. Does that make sense, Jim? No, definitely. I like that's the. I know you usually do that with the US dollar fluctuation mm. to take out. Mm. So yeah, over three months, it's a good way to approach actually to take out any risk or not risk, but volatility. Because you, if you go big in purple uh, now at one twenty-five, and when the hype kind of settles down, yeah. well, you could have bought at one thirty, thirty, one thirty-five last week, and when the hype settles down and it comes, it kind of stabilizes around one hundred five, one hundred seven. Uh, You've got a 20% uptick. I, I did on my intrinsic value model and on the exponentiality of the company, I, I could see it trading at about 150 uh, in 18 months time. In other words, after the next set of annual results are out by extrapolating uh, what the valuation would be on the kind of exponential uh, increases that we're looking at. But if you're buying at 135 and you go to 150 in 18 months, mm, you know, you're going to make money later. Yeah. Uh, but who knows? I, it's, just, it's just being a little bit conservative. And that's what we're going to do with Purple Capital. So that's the, the story with Easy Equities. Oh, one last thing about Easy Equities. It is 30% owned by Sunlum. So they have a big brother, does the Purple Capital in... Uh, in Sunlum put 100 million rand in working capital in to get us 30 percent great investment for Sunlum and when we spoke to Paul Hanratty the CEO of Sunlum he said this because there were rumors at the time that Sunlum was not going to be continuing with its investment he said that's a lot of rot he loves it so with Sunlum as a as a partner who may who knows at one point in time make easy equities uh, shareholders an offer they can't refuse maybe and with uh, the partnership with Capitech, which is really, really only hitting its straps now, you are onto something here. Uh, add on the fractional investment and the very, very low cost and the masses of South Africans who are discovering equities for the first time. Uh, it's an exponential company and they're broken into profit as well. So all round. Yeah, I think it was also a good leadership, Alec. I think Charles is very passionate. I mean, I know you've had him a few times on you, but he, he lives it. And I also said, if you look at, they used to have an office in Hyde Park, but to cut costs, they moved to, towards 44 Stanley to make the business sort of work so that they do live what they do. And I think they're democratizing. That's it. It's a good, for, a true form of democracy for people to invest. And democratizing think, investing. So it's, it's exactly that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Charles Savage was at our uh, Biz News investment conference and was extremely impressed. One of the guys who was there uh, after he listened to Charles went outside and bought 50,000 rands worth of the shares. He'd be happy because he bought them at 80 cents, I think it was. Anyway, so those are our two additions and they've been done in a different way. There it is. You can see that Tongart, we bought the whole slug, 441,000 rand. Uh, Purple Group, we bought only one third of it, 147,000 rand. And uh, we'll be purchasing more of the Purple Group, uh, another 250,000 Rand of it over the next two months. Just on the two purchases, Alec, Andrew wants to know, there are both investments in SA. Can you make money from an economy that is failing? 
you can if and 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 there's a there's some very very good reasons for that um the primary reason is that many entrepreneurs are leaving and capital is leaving and foreigners aren't coming in to compete so you sit with a, a most unusual situation here where you don't have a, a an an increase in competition but actually a decrease because of the emigration factor and because of no new foreigners coming in. And you've got a, a country where the skills are very high. You can arbitrage from this country as well, uh, those skills into the international community and you have a weak currency. So when you look at it from an entrepreneur's point of view, don't try and change the world. Just have a look within what are the parameters that you have to operate within. If those parameters go crazy, in other words, had Jacob Zuma remained president, we wouldn't have even been talking about any of this. Because with the way that Zuma and his plunderers were going and what they were doing to the country, they could actually not give a, a, a tuppence halfpenny for what would happen in the longer term in this country you would have been for sure seen taxes gone up. Uh, the wealth tax, um, high income tax, things would have gone very pear shape in South Africa. What did we see in the last budget? We saw the company tax being reduced from 28 to 27%. What is that? It's sending a signal to business, please, we need you. That's the only way we're going to uh, attack unemployment. We also saw no increase in personal taxes, personal income tax rates for high earners not something that would have been thought about even or even understood by the Zuma administration and this Malusi Gigaba and the people that he had there who literally were, were looking at it from, from different with different incentives. Now at the those who are governing the country and there's a heck of a lot wrong with the ANC, they do at least realize that you can't squeeze juice out of a lemon that's had all the juice squeezed out of it. If you try that, you're going to just hurt yourself by exporting the entrepreneurs who still remain. So when you have a look at this from a, an entrepreneurial perspective, you haven't, you've got a country where the governance is not getting worse, it's getting better on the one hand. And on the other hand, you've got a lack of competition from abroad and internally because people are leaving. So, yeah, the economy is certainly not growing at the rate that uh, you would, that would excite anyone, but that's being offset by the opportunities. But you've got to be careful. You've got to be very, very, very selective about where you place your bets. And Purple Capital is one where you can place your bets quite comfortably as you can with Tongot Hewlett. A purple capital, they're, they're worth about the same, as I said earlier, this is worth about 1.3 billion, Tongot Hewlett 1.4 billion. Uh, you, so it's all in the price on Tongot Hewlett. On purple capital, it's an exponential company that is targeting a market segment that is massive and untapped. And those are the reasons why, if you're very careful, I don't throw, babies out with bath waters. I, I was reading Helen Ziller's book last night, just finished it actually. It's a, it's not a very long book. It takes a few hours to read uh, where she says, go work, go broke, or stay woke, go broke. And it's, it's a very sobering book. But in there, she quotes Jan Smuts, uh, uh, one of the great statesmen to come out of South Africa, who said that the worst never happens in South Africa, but neither does the best. And what he meant by that was the forecasts of what's going to go on in this country always seem to be exaggerated one side or the other, and we kind of muddle through. If we muddle through those businesses that are targeted in areas where either they've been massively undervalued or where there's um, potential for explosive growth like Purple Group, like uh, Karoo or the old car track is a good example. There are those gems around. You just, just got to work a bit harder to find them. I say with easy, you've also got to look at the globalization fact. I know they're going to Oz, but it's not where they want to end, you know, and take their product else to other parts of the country, uh, the world. Sorry, not the country. Well, why not? If, if they've got a model that works, they've got fractional investing. Yep. Uh, they, I don't know where in the UK you can buy 
get into a fractional investing stockbroker. You can, of course, in the United States with Robin Hood and uh, Toro and some of the others. But in the UK, it's not really their culture yet. So prove, prove your point in Australia and who knows where you might end up. I just, I just like the fractionalization story and the, uh, the, the low cost. And they've got both of those right. Many people try these things. Very few achieve uh, the ability to make a profit. And they're making profits there. So it's a bit like Netflix. Netflix doesn't need to borrow any more money. After years and years and years of borrowing, doesn't need to. Now it's starting to talk about buying back shares. They're going to be spending about $5 billion in the next quarter buying back their own shares. Why? Because they can see what their cash position is like. It's a bit like when you, when you look at Amazon and uh, Alphabet, which came out with spectacular results today. Amazon and Alphabet for years and years and years made losses. And people would, look, and NASPAS as well, people would look at it and say, no, crumbs are these, you know, how can you value these companies at this level? You need to embrace ex exponentiality because when it breaks up, when it actually goes into positive and there's zero and two, you are in the same situation, years of losses, breaking into profitability, that's the time to be very serious about these stocks and purples on that, uh, on that trajectory as well. So there's the portfolio after today's changes. And uh, again, the one at the bottom is a little small to read, uh, but if you look at the top, you can see Amazon, Apple, we're not touching those. Uh, NicePass, I've, I've given you a, a big question mark. Microsoft, excellent results coming out today, justifying the, the recent improvement in the price. Discovery has written back a huge amount already on its, uh, on its COVID exposure. I like what they're doing with the bank, but Discovery's story is much more a global story, uh, vitality in the UK, which will get a huge boost from COVID because people now know what it's like to have to rely on the NHS. Netflix mentioned that earlier, Zero also breaking into profit. Wilson Bailey is a play on South African infrastructure to you breaking into profit. And there's Tongart and Purple who are today's additions. Sure, thanks, I see we've almost come up to the hour, top of the hour, but um, I think you just touched on WBHO. Peter wants to know, is the WBHO theme still valid? It's in a long-term downtrend since the 2018 lower lows. Yeah, it's very valid uh, because if South Africa is going to expand in, uh, or get itself out of the economic funk that it's in, it's going to need construction. And there's one construction company left, and that's Wilson Bailey Homes. It was the always the blue chip construction company. And I know that, that it's easy to criticize the ANC. They, they, they open their mouths to, to change feet. The economic policies of data deployment and broad-based black economic empowerment, which is really a slogan that enables Picada deployment and then lead to make more money. And there's so much wrong with them. But the one thing that they do have at the moment is somebody who has a notion of what's needed to improve the economy. And he has completely bought into the idea, this is Sura Maposa, that you need to invest in infrastructure. And anybody who's had a look at the at the state of the infrastructure in South Africa will know that that's not an idle thought. That is desperately needed. Infrastructure is fantastic because it does have a wonderful multiplier effect on the economy. And if you're going to invest in infrastructure, there's one company that stands above all of them, and that's Wilson Bailey. So I'm quite happy. I mean, it got down to 80 Rand at one point after we bought the shares. Uh, it's now at least showing a little profit, a nice profit in yeah. US dollar terms, 28%. But in rands, it's in, in, in the, on the right side. I don't think we are going to be disappointed by Wilson Bailey. It's also, remember, got some fabulous international assets. Uh, the share price did go up when there was the thought that the Aussie uh, uh, firm uh, would be sold. Uh, the Chinese made an unsolicited bid. If the Chinese who are savvy businessmen, were prepared to pay a significant premium for the Aussie business, somebody else might come along knocking for that as well. So the Australian government turned it down by, because they said that the Aussie business was Wilson Bailey's Aussie business, which by the way, produces more than half of its turnover, was a strategic asset uh, and not to be sold to Chinese. It doesn't mean they can't be sold to Australians 
or to Brits or to Americans or somebody that the Australian government likes. The fact of the matter is that they've already signaled, Wilson Bailey have, that the Australian company is available at the right price to the right bidder. And well, that would transform. It's a bit like NicePass. If NicePass were to unbundle its shareholding in Tencent, the share price would, I'm not sure it would double, but it would certainly go up massively from where it is now. Similarly with Wilson Bailey, if it were to have an unsolicited bid for its Australian business, that share price would rocket. It does have very successful businesses also in the UK. So there's a company, you're buying a global uh, infrastructure company, but, uh, and, and very well run as well, but you've also got the South African turnaround factor. Excellent, thanks, Alec. I think we're going to leave it here. Eh? Um, yeah, just go through the last uh, slide there. You can see, um, I wanted to put this on the screen so you could see where the RAND was. The whole idea of the global portfolio was to be a RAND hedge and to allocate the investments into uh, companies that would outperform um, zero, basically. So the idea, if we had just put it into a RAND uh, into US dollars, taking it offshore, as a lot of people did, and just put it into money market account. We would be, you can see right in the bottom there, that's the Rand US dollar appreciation over the last six and a quarter years, six and a third years rather. Um, we've been very fortunate in the stock selections in that they have outperformed uh, the Rand, so, or the Rand dollar rate. So actually it's added value to the portfolio through the stock selections. That is the end of that. Don't forget to join us at 5.30 tonight, biznewsradio.com. And uh, we we on every weekday night, excepting this week, we've taken a bit of a break, haven't we, Stu? You're actually supposed to be on holiday. Can't miss this portfolio discussion, Alex. Very important for our futures. Um, <laughs> and don't forget tomorrow. Tomorrow yes. we've got a, a webinar on 12J. Now that's that's a that seriously there's no brainers and there's real no brainers and the 12J is a real no brainer. Tomorrow we're going to be unpacking what 12J is. Are we looking at it in a broader context? Uh, you might know uh, that the 12J is a tax incentive that the government have abolished, so they've done away with it. But we've got until the 30th of June this year to invest in 12J companies. We've got five for you that we're going to be exposing over the next few weeks or up until the 30th of June. And whatever you put into that company, you can write back immediately against your taxable income. So basically, if you're in the top marginal tax bracket, you're getting a 45% contribution from the tax man. The, 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 the strings attached, you've got to hold it for five years and you've got to find a, a business that's actually delivering a, a good dividend. And that gives you, as we've done with uh, Bright Light Solar, they aren't looking for money, so they aren't one of our five companies, but uh, Bright Light Solar are delivering projections of 19 to 22% uh, per annum as an effective return. Those are numbers that, that are very hard to beat. So join us tomorrow at noon. Uh, it is a webinar, not just for premium subscribers, for everybody, but you can get all the details from your various emails or indeed going onto the web. Uh, onto the business website. Until then, uh, we'll, be, we'll be back then, won't we, Stu? Yeah, we'll be back tomorrow at 12. Alec, and just for those, if you want a repeat of this, it obviously goes onto the business TV channel, which is on YouTube, and it takes the team about an hour, an hour and a half to get it up there. Or replay. It's yeah, that's pretty quick, pretty quick on it. So um, until the next time, yeah. cheerio. <laughs>